both central and southern United States is a region rich in woodlands, fields, and running streams, in folklore and traditions. Hunting is one of the oldest traditions, and high on the list of sporting game is a bird that has become a tradition itself, the bobwhite quail. It's spring. May apples thrust green umbrellas above the warming ground, and Bob White's covey, released from winter hardship, enjoys the sunshine of a balmy day. This six to seven ounce bird is our native Bob White quail. Woods quail, topknot quail, Dutch quail. These are but fanciful names for the one species we have in the central part of the range. Head and throat markings distinguish the cock from the hen. The eye line and throat patch are white on the cock, buff colored on the hen. The deep leaf litter shelters seeds and insects available for the scratching. In spring, quail food is at the year's low. Burning would have destroyed this feeding ground for Bob White. The birds enjoy loafing in the warm sun. Spring flowers, like the nodding Dutchman's breeches and purple trillium, mark April's swift advance. Frequent dust baths clean the plumage and help control parasites. Note how the hen blends perfectly into the mottled background. Constant alertness is the price of survival in Bob White's world. Rustling leaves startle the birds until they see it's just a box turtle. He's a harmless part of the community, so the birds relax again. The bickering of hens marks the season's unrest a sign of the covey breakup soon to come. <coughs> Cocks are becoming irritable too and challenge one another. Fighting is a sign of the development of rivalry for mates. Now, it's mostly talk. The hen, the object of it all, seems unaware of any trouble. This male, sensing a movement above, glances up and sees only a harmless creature, a Baltimore Oriole. Reassured, the cock returns to his intended purpose to utter his familiar call. A female hears, but seems indifferent. And not to be outdone, the cock stretches lazily. The first thing is to show her who's boss. A little strutting and pecking fail to intimidate the hen. The male assumes the initiative in final mate selection, while the hen, 
true to her sex, does not betray her emotions. Courting with playful pursuits and strutting plumage displays becomes more intense as spring advances. Such displays remind us of the antics of the turkey gobbler and the prairie chicken. The hen is still unimpressed. So the male, not discouraged, woos her more ardently. A nearby bachelor challenges the possession of the female. Ignoring the challenge, the original suitor continues his courting efforts. Now the rival male appears on the scene and attacks the hen suitor. In mating fervor, Bob Whites become quite belligerent. Fights like this, shown here in slow motion, are seldom seen by man. Fighting may be severe, but birds are seldom killed or even badly hurt. Once paired, cock and hen stay together, making their own dust bath with bills and feet. They roost together, away from the covey for the first time. By late April, when wild mustard blooms, the coveys are completely broken up. The business of mating and nest building has begun. Our female has completed her nest at the base of a clump of tall grass. She lays an egg nearly every day, sometimes skips. It takes from two to three weeks to complete a clutch. Many quail nest in field border cover. Farming activities nearby do not seem to disturb the birds. grass and weeds don't seem as attractive to some farmers as they do to quail. To this farmer, the border would look better if cleaned of weeds and grass. To the hen, the weeds and grass are protection. But cover that offers shelter from predators cannot withstand the flare of a match. Fed by last year's accumulation of dried vegetation, the fire spreads fast. As smoke gets into his eyes, this young box turtle is confused. remains on her nest till the fire sweeps across it. The flames and drifting smoke spell destruction to many kinds of wildlife. Burning is one of the many farm activities that destroy quail nests. Cover and food are fire's chief toll, but the scorched mass of quail eggs and the remains of this young rabbit show that life, too, may be destroyed. The quail pair, with their first nest destroyed, must find a new home. The hen picks this fence row for her second nest. Narrow strips of cover sometimes attract quail when nothing better is available, but they are far from safe. By plowing so close to the fence, the farmer may gain a couple of rows of corn. 
but lose the benefits of a wildlife crop. Narrow fence rows are travel lanes for predators. Our hen's second nest is broken up. The skunk had no trouble finding the nest a few inches from his path. In good cover, the skunk is not a serious predator on quail. Here, he could hardly miss the nest. Renesting is common in the quail world. Our hen will try again. A multiflora rose fence with its borders covers a strip 10 feet wide. The uniformity of its fine cover affords good protection. The hen builds her third nest under its thorny shelter. By the time the rose has stopped blooming, the long task of incubation has begun. The embryo's heart, after two and a half days of incubation, can be seen beating in the web of blood vessels. At 12 days, the eye of the chick is well developed. After 17 days, the feathers show. The body outline is clearly seen. After 21 days, the chick starts to pip the egg. By the 23rd day, the large end is completely chipped around. The end is pushed back like a trapdoor on a hinge and the struggling wet ball emerges. Note the white egg tooth on top of the beak with which the bird chipped the shell. A few hours after hatching begins, the nest seethes with life. The chicks are very lively as soon as dry. An early instinct is to feed, and the major job of the hen, after drying the chicks, is to find them food. The cock, who has been on sentry duty during incubation, comes in to help. The parent birds seem anxious to leave the vicinity of the nest where they have been pinned down for three weeks. They take advantage of all cover, hurry through the open spots. From now on, they'll be a moving unit as the chicks get their training in food getting and danger avoiding. Summer is the season of production and growth on the farm and in the wild. Mating and hatching, flowering and fruiting, feeding and growing is the order of the summer days. Other animals are having their little troubles too. This tree bat nourishes her young while suspended upside down in her leafy nursery. In a nearby slough, a catfish guards eggs lying in the hollow log nest like a quart of spilled pearls. At intervals, she aerates the eggs, fans them free from silt. In the plowed field, the killdeer's nest shows one exception to the rule that wildlife needs cover. The color of the eggs and of the bird blends perfectly into the background, and this is cover enough. The same is true of the tree toad, doing his best to look like a milkweed leaf. The cock, with part of the three-day-old brood, has taken to the cornfield. Rising clouds foreshadow a sudden summer storm. 
The disked dirt of the cornfield is a fine place to scratch for last year's seeds and small insects of early summer. It's a fine place for frequent dust baths, too. When the cock finds a choice bit, he calls the chicks in to share it. As the first drops of rain spatter in the dust, the cock leads his little charges into better cover. One chick, slower to respond, straggles behind. That's fatal, for he loses the disappearing covey. The rain beats down harder. Bewildered, the lost chick stands helpless in the rain. Farther into the cornfield, the cock broods the chick safely against the wet and cold. Somewhere, back in the grass, the hen is doing the same with the rest of the brood. This is just one example of what happens to chicks not alert enough to stay with their parents. As the rainbow marks the end of the brief storm, we are reminded that in the wild, the penalty of heedlessness is death. The quail family ranges over a rather small area. The trumpet vine, with its tangle of cover, is a favorite dusting place for this family. At seven days of age, the chicks show little plumage change. Quail need moisture, and dew on vegetation is one common source. Even the chicks are adept at sipping dewdrops from flowers and leaves. When dew fails, other sources of water are important. A pond, for instance, with plenty of cover around it, provides a safe watering place the year round. Notice the different sizes of young birds. The pair has accepted chicks from other broods which have lost their parents. A close look will show three age groups. The pair's own 10-day-olds, a larger three-week-old chick, and several smaller ones. Such incidents give rise to the idea that a pair will raise two or more broods in a summer. This is not true. Quail raise only one brood, but will care for strays from others. A pond shore is a good place to find insects. Insects are rich in protein, and protein is a major requirement for growing chicks. The parents catch and subdue the larger insects for the chicks. Insects supply moisture, too. The little fellows tackle anything they can handle. Among the insects eaten by quail are many that destroy foliage and damage crops. Blackberries are an important part of the habitat. The vines furnish year-round cover, the berries food and water. On the farm, harvest continues with oat cutting. The business of feeding, learning, and growing occupies all the wild creatures.
the Kakanin are never far apart. Here, by the trumpet vine, they feed and loaf with their family. At three weeks of age, the down of the chicks is being replaced with juvenile feathers. In the foreground, the runt of the flock shows poor feather development. An Osage orange hedge next to corn is good protection and the quail family feeds close to its thorny cover. At five weeks of age, the birds are beginning to feather out and resemble the parents. Other creatures sometimes use Osage orange for cover too. This cooper's hawk, perched in the concealment of the hedge, intently watches the birds feed, waiting for one to stray out in the open. One does stray, as usual, the backward one of the brood. This is what the hawk has been waiting for. This is one of the many types of natural mortality constantly whittling down the number of chicks. While cobras and sharp-shinned hawks sometimes take quail, they usually catch the slower, weaker, or more stupid of the brood. Other hawks are too slow and clumsy to catch a healthy quail. It is the strongest and most alert birds that survive for game and breeding stock. Summer fades into early fall. Brightening colors and ripening fruits point up the last surge of production and the beginning of autumn's rich abundance. Dogwood berries are ruby ripe. Bittersweet awaits the finishing touch of frost. Through nature's magic, summer flowers have been changed into the seeds for life's renewal. In plant life, as in human life, maturity has a beauty all its own. The groundhog stores up fat for winter's long sleep. Migrant monarch butterflies feed deeply on summer's last blossoms before the long trip south. In the summer breeding grounds, far to the north, Wild geese strengthen their wings in trial flights. On the farm, shocked corn and annual weeds are ready for bobwhite staking. A cornfield is a wonderful place for quail to feed. Foxtail and other annuals now, corn for later in the year. In late winter, wild seeds may become scarce. Then corn is very important. And the thoughtful farmer who leaves a little corn in the field for the bird's winter use can be sure it will be a real help in pulling them through the spring. Sometimes, in crop rotation, wheat follows corn, and the fine food combination pictured here is not available. At 14 weeks, the young still have some pin feathers on the head, but the white throat patch of the cock shows distinct from the buff of the hen's throat and head. The birds wander widely now and search for tidbits. With maturity, they have developed a strong cubby sense. When one finds especially attractive food, the others gather around to share it. They now act together as a cubby unit. Sensing a movement overhead, the birds become alarmed. It's a harmless buzzard, but the attack by the cooper's hawk some weeks before has made them wary of large birds in the sky. With a common impulse, the covey takes refuge in the corn shock. The innocent cause of it all soars on, indifferent to the alarm. 
The birds quickly realize the buzzard is harmless. Had this really been a cooper's hawk, the covey might have remained under shelter all day. In the large variety of seeds eaten by quail, about a dozen supply most of their winter diet. Besides corn, there is Korean Lespedeza. Here's an extreme close-up, a quail's eye view. Sorghum cane, a cultivated food. Foxtail, common byproduct of cultivation. Little ragweed, sneezeweed, some call it. Giant ragweed, or horseweed. Here, readily identified by its three-lobed leaf. The meat of acorns. Beggar tick, a wild legume. Sumac. The seed heads, high on stout stems, are available even in deep snow. Croton, common pasture weed. Grasshoppers are the insect most commonly eaten. Late fall marks the season's change in a mad blaze of color. Falling leaves reduce overhead protective cover. If not burned, the leaves protect seeds and other foods on the ground where quail forage. Even so, food and cover can support just so many quail through the winter, fewer than are annually produced. This surplus may be harvested without harm to the stock. Now the quail cubbies are moving about the countryside in what is called the fall shuffle, a mixing of birds among different broods. Other mixing devices are the covey breakup and forming of pairs in spring, adoption of lost chicks in summer, and the coming together of covey remnants in winter. In the fall, quail spend much time in the woods. Here the ground is fairly open for easy feeding. Enough leaves remain for overhead protection. Now, nesting and production are over. Nature's storehouse is full, and for a little time existence is easier, but not for long. Soon the hunting season and the hazards of winter will approach. At sunset, the birds utter the coveying call, which means roosting time. When roosting, the birds draw together in a tail-to-tail heads-out circle that ensures warmth and a lookout in every direction. The period of growth and training is over. The unfit have been weeded out. The survivors are alert and vigorous, fit to uphold the traditions of this favored game bird in the quail range. Opportunities for hunting on farmlands are dependent on cordial relations with the landowner. These friendly relations are developed only when hunters show farmers every consideration. A sportsman never fails to ask permission before hunting. Good dogs are a practical aid, and a well-trained one heads for likely cover. Katie, a pointer, takes off fast and ranges widely. Bo, the setter, works more slowly, closer to the hunters. 
Some sportsmen favor the pointer, others prefer setters. Both have their points. Together, they make a fine team. The dogs locate quail by scent. Katie works over this patch of cover thoroughly. Fence rows afford good protection for quail. After the early morning feeding, quail retire to good cover to loaf and dust. Alarmed, they head for still denser cover. Katie has caught the scent of the running birds. Following it to where the birds have stopped, she comes to a point. Bow stops, frozen in mid-stride, to honor Katie's find. Now the birds are pinned down. The rest is up to the hunter. This one's wing-tipped. It's the dog's job to find and retrieve. Here's where the use of a good dog is conservation. Birds that might be lost to human eyes are located by the dog's keen nose. Now it's Bo's turn. A perfect retrieve is a joy to watch. And the first bird of the hunt is always a bird to admire. After the covey is scattered, the hunters go after a few singles. First single is found. Some of the birds have headed into the sumac by the new pond. This brushy fence row with standing and cut down trees will give protection against predators and winter weather. Katie locates the second single at the base of the new pond dam. time the hunter reloads, the pointer has another find. Could Katie be wrong? The hunters think so, but Katie doesn't. dog is right. The wise sportsman takes only a few birds from each covey, leaving plenty to ensure breeding stock. This tall growth right next to the timber is Ceresia lespediza. Growing well on poor soil, which it enriches, Ceresia furnishes good ground cover and emergency food for quail. This shorter, darker growth is Korean lespediza, a good farm forage crop and a commonly used quail food. That's a small cubby. Let's skip the singles. A mixture of cover and food, well distributed in waste areas between croplands, provides ideal quail habitat.
In good cover, a 10th acre food patch with a variety of cultivated grains, legumes, and wild annuals furnishes food throughout the winter for a covey or two. Bo locates the covey that uses this food patch and Katie comes in on a nice bit of teamwork. Clean misses are a part of the game. Katie picks up a down bird, and Bo comes straight across the food patch to deliver another. Hunting's been fine, but a rest period is welcome. These interested hunters examine their birds closely. The proportion of young to adults indicates the success of the summer's hatch. It's easy to tell young from old birds. The light-colored tips of the primary wing coverts mark a young bird hatched this year. On the adults, tips of the primary wing coverts are almost uniformly dark. In the fall quail crop, adults are far outnumbered by the young. The season's kill normally runs four young to one adult. Time to move on. A farm as well developed for quail as this one has more cubbies to find. All idle areas are in cover, showing that this farmer realizes the value of protecting land that would otherwise erode. In such habitat, quail thrive, providing plenty of birds for a safe harvest while still leaving an adequate breeding stock. As the day goes on, events seem to run together in a series of points and cubby rises misses and clean kills. Memory retains only the highlights that constitute the lure that draws men with gun and dogs into the quail ranges, year after year to hunt and shoot, or just to watch the dogs. As shadows lengthen, the dogs are still going strong. Bo winds up the day and the season in a last magnificent point. As the season draws to a close, heavy gray clouds foreshadow the closing down of winter with its new problems of weather and other hardships. Snowstorms are one of the hazards of winter, although they affect quail less than we used to believe. Most snowstorms in the main quail range are of short duration. In good cover, quail find ample refuge. Where cover is absent as here, of course the story is different. Some of the birds get restless. Now they require abundant good food to maintain body heat. They wander out of the shelter for short trips, but as long as it is snowing, they do not go far. By the time the snow stops falling, it is late in the day. Night is coming on. In the dim winter twilight, the birds attempt to feed before going to roost. Seldom do they hole up throughout stormy periods. Quail need food, and they forage for it, or become weakened and or lost. Corn is one of the most important energy-producing winter foods. Years of corn left in the field after harvest, either as waste or deliberately for wildlife, are heavily used by quail. One bird appears sick. Even under good conditions, a quail's life is very short. Most breeding pairs in any spring were raised only the summer before. A bird that escapes predators, starvation and accident
still must face old age from which there is no escape. If there were no predators or harvest, quail would still die at a rapid rate. The many young raised each year keep populations going and provide most of the harvest. This bird did not survive the snowstorm. With a good feed of corn tucked away, the birds can roost safely from the cold. Ice storms are a more severe hazard than snowstorms. Ice covers food on the ground and on the plants with impervious armor. Yet quail must feed, so they step out to forage in the glitter of an icy dawn. Birds must be vigorous and in good health to survive a situation like this. Even standing food like coralberry or buckbrush is covered with ice. So is multiflora rose, but it still offers shelter and some food in the leaves and litter. berries, ice coated now, will be available when the thaw comes. Not finding much food, the birds head out for the open. A fox is abroad looking for food too. His normal supply of mice and berries is cut off by the snow and ice. Only when quail are unusually exposed in their search for food is the red fox a menace to them. Good cover plus plenty of food is the best protection for birds. Scattered feathers and the marks of a scuffle in the snow show that hungry birds in poor cover can be surprised. From fall through winter, quail numbers are gradually reduced by natural mortality until by spring only a few are left. This loss is remarkably constant whether there is hunting or not. This explains why reasonable hunting does not harm the quail population. It also explains why the hunting season is set early in the fall so that as much as possible of this natural mortality can be salvaged for human use. Winter, with its ice and snows, eventually gives way to spring. The birds can range more widely now to forage for food in the litter of field and woodland floor. These few birds are what is left of the large fall covey. No more would have survived, even had there been no hunting, for this is all the winter habitat could support. These are plenty, though, to restore the population for next fall. Once on its way, spring comes swiftly. The green hood of the may apple pushes through the sun-warmed soil. The elm twigs are festooned with buds. Later, the red bud blossoms. Box elder hangs out its flowers. Dutchman's breeches nod in the balmy breeze. Catkins decorate the branches of the cottonwood. A woodcock, on her nest, demonstrates nature's camouflage. A spring peeper calls from the roadside ditch. The toad heralds the spring. On the wide uplands, the prairie chicken struts and booms his mating call. <laughs> and from the woodland edge, the bobwhite quail sends the clearest call of all. <laughs>